So in summary, we have a public key encryption algorithm. Remember, public key encryption. Encrypt with one key, decrypt with another. So we don't have a shared secret. We have one secret key and one public key. And there are different algorithms to do public key encryption. RSA is one of them. The encryption is easy. The encryption is conceptually easy. Take your message, raise it to the power of some number e, mod by n, and you get your ciphertext. Where m is an integer, less than n. So that's the condition there so far. So you treat your message as an integer. So you need to somehow map it to a number. And m must be less than n. Decryption is that we take the ciphertext, raise it to some power d, and mod by the same n. And we need to get the same m back as we started with the input. The key generation steps are such that, well, there's two reasons. One is we must choose the keys, which really are the values of e, n, and d. We must choose them such that we do get the same m back. It's no good if we encrypt, decrypt, and get the wrong plain text. So the key generation steps are chosen such that we will get the same m back no matter what the value of the original plaintext. And the other reason they're chosen is so that attacks will be uh, not possible in practice. So that's why the key generation steps are these three steps. So what we got to yesterday is we're trying to explain why we'll always get the same M back. So this was from yes yesterday, from Tuesday. If we start with some, these are the two equa equations for encryption and decryption. If we look at the decryption equation, when someone decrypts some ciphertext, the M that they get must be the same as the original plaintext. So what I've done is said, Okay, if we take C, our ciphertext raised to the power of D mod N, the answer will be some M prime. We need this M prime to be the same as the original M. Where C was obtained by taking the original M and raising to the power of E mod by N. So I substitute C with this part of the equation. And we put m to the power of e mod n inside the brackets, raised to the power of d mod n. And then we solve for this side as much as we can. And one of the characteristics of modular arithmetic with multiplication and therefore exponentiation is we can, and you can check, you can do the full expansion into multiplication, m to the power of e mod n all to the power of d is the same as m to the power of e to the power of d mod n. And same with your normal arithmetic, m to the power of e to the power of d is m to the power of e times d. So that was the step I did from here to here. m to the power of e d mod n mod n, same. And as you should know, with mod, when you mod a number, and then you mod this that answer with the same modulus, you'll get the original number back. So some number mod n, mod n, is the same as that number mod n once. Modding again doesn't change the value. 23 mod 10 is 13. Or, no, that's a bad example. 13 mod 10 is 3. Mod 10 again, we get 3. Mod 10 again, we get 3, and so on. So modding multiple times is the same as modding once. So that's why we effectively cancel out this mod n. We remove it. So what we get, the decrypted plain text, m prime, will equal the original plain text, m, raised to the power of ed mod n. What we need is values of E, D, and N such that M equals M prime. Because our requirement is that the 
received plain text m prime must be the same as the original plain text m. So then we ask ourselves, what values of e, d, and n can we choose such that m prime will always be the same as m? And that's when we take advantage of Fermat's theorem, is that right? Where we said Euler's, Euler's theorem. You're correct. Euler's theorem, back in the number theory lecture notes, said one form said, looking here, some integer to the power of some, no, actually this one. Euler's theorem says some integer a to the power of the totient of n plus 1 mod n is always equal to a. That's Euler's theorem. That's given, we know that. So if we have some integer raised to the power of the totient of the modulus and plus 1, we'll get that integer back as the answer. We use that in our, to satisfy the conditions for our RSA decryption. <coughs> Because we see the RSA, or this equation here, has a similar structure. We want m prime and m to be the same. So the question is, what values of e, d, and n such that they will always be the same? Well, if we can write this equation, I just replace m prime with a, m with a, and compare these two. We know this one's true. We've got an equation in this form, so that means if we set ED to the totient of n plus 1, we get the, our equation in the form of Euler's theorem. In other words, if ED equals the totient of n plus 1, then this equation would be m prime equals m to the totient of n plus 1 mod n, which is in the format of Euler's theorem, which tells us m will always be equal to m prime, which is what we require. So this is leading us to the condi conditions for choosing the keys, the key generation steps. So the current state is we say e times d must equal the totient of n plus 1. The other way to think of that, if we take ED and divide by the totient of n, the remainder should be 1. Because if we divide both sides by the totient of n, this one will give us 1, and this will give us e to the d divided by n, or we think of it as a modulus. Let's consider that and continue with our... Uh, equation. Maybe I, we rushed that last week. Why is this true? E, to, e times d. Let's have an example just to the right. Let's say we have 21 If 21 equals 20 plus 1, we can think of that as 21 mod 20 equals 1. Mod 20, remember we effectively divide and what's the remainder? If we have 20 plus 1, if we mod this by 20, the remainder will always be this plus part. So if 20 plus 1 mod by 20, the remainder will be 1. So that's the concept we're using there. E to the d, no, e times d equals the totient of n plus 1. So if we mod this by the totient of n, the remainder will always be 1. So we can write it e times d mod the totient of n equals 1. So that's the condition so far for key generation. The next step is 
choose an E, D, and N such that that is true. Choose E, D, and N such that this equation is always true. Well, to find an answer, this says E and D are multiplicative inverses in the totient of N. Multiplicative inverse is when you times them together and you get 1 as the answer. In our normal arithmetic, you times two numbers together and you get one as the answer, then we say they're inverses of each other. The same concept. When does a number have a multiplicative inverse? Coming back to our number theory, a number has a multiplicative inverse when that number is relatively prime with the totient of n. So we need to choose some number, say e, which will have a multiplicative inverse d and the conditions is choose an e so let's say we choose any e not all values have a multiplicative, multiplicative inverse in the totient of n the values that we know do are those that are relatively prime with the totient of n so choose an e such that I'll note here RP, relatively prime. E and the totient of N are relatively prime. In other words, the greatest common divisor of these two values is 1. Equals 1. If we want to be able to find a multiplicative inverse, we need to choose an E which is relatively prime with the totient of N or has a greatest common divisor with the totient of N of 1. And there are multiple values there. And if we can choose an E which meets that requirement, then we can find a D and then we have values that make sure that RSA decryption will always work. Once we can choose an E, we can calculate a D. There are, value, there are algorithms to do that reasonably efficiently. To calculate the multiplicative inverse, there are algorithms that would do it for us when we have large numbers. What we've done is shown for RSA to work, we must choose an E which is relatively prime with the totient of N or the greatest common divisor of E in the totient of N equals 1. If you go back to your lecture notes, that's what we did. This step 2. We chose an E where the greatest common divisor of the totient of N and E is 1. So that's why we did this step, to make sure that the decryption will always work. We can calculate D, that's step 3. And therefore, RSA always is successful if we choose our numbers according to this key generation steps. The first step, why did we choose two primes? Finding the totient of n for a large n is hard. Unless n equals the, is the multiplication of two primes that we know of. That's why we chose the first step. So, Calculating the totient of n for an arbitrary n, we cannot always do. We can only do it, or we can do it quickly if n is a multiplication of two prime primes that we know. And that leads us to the first step. So, should be able to prove RSA in the exam in next year. prove that RSA works is something you should be able to do in an exam. Let's, let's attack RSA, which you should be able to do in an exam as well. Or let's look at the avenues for attack. What can an attacker do to A, try and find the plain text? and B, try and find the private key. 
and then we'll look at, well, why is RSA secure? Let's have a look. What we require of RSA. What we just went through is the first one. We said for RSA to be able to decrypt, we must be able to find values of E, D and N, really the key values, such that M to the power of E, D mod N is equal to M for all M less than N. And that's true in when we choose them according to that key generation step. The other requirement is that the normal user, when they encrypt something, it should be easy to calculate M to the power of E mod N. And when they decrypt something, it should be easy to decrypt. When I say easy, it means it needs to be fast to do it with computer when we use large numbers. So that's the requirement to make it practical. If it takes 10 years to encrypt a file with RSA, then it's not very practical. So we need it in the order of uh, milliseconds, for example. So it should be practical to use, that's step two. Step one is saying it always decrypts successfully. Step three is saying that the attacker should not be able to find the secret values. Should not be able to find D given E and N. Let's see what the attacker can try and do. Has everyone got the, the lecture notes in the copy center? I put them in on Tuesday after someone reminded me in the lecture. Uh, they're still not there? Okay, so you've got blank paper. Uh, yes, yeah, so someone reminded me there's the new batch of lecture notes which cover these topics are in the... Comp well, I put them in the copy center on Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon after the, the lecture. Has anyone checked today? Yes. Yeah? Yes, they're online as well. Uh, but the, the new handout should be in the copy center. Um, yes, bound. As, as the instructions I, I gave them, it should be bound, but maybe it's taking a long time to copy. Sorry about that. Uh, you have to survive for today at least. Let's attack RSA. Uh, let's find our example. We had an example, a simple example we went through on Tuesday. We said that to generate the key, we choose two prime numbers, P and Q. I chose 17 and 11. Okay, the small numbers, so I can calculate. I calculated n, just multiply the values together, I get 187. And then I calculate the totient of n, and I use this property that the totient of some number, which is where we know the two prime factors, we know the prime factors of n, they are 17 and 11, then the totient of that number is the totient of those two prime numbers multiplied together. So we can simply calculate the totient of n to be 160. Totient of 17 times the totient of 11. 16 times 10. So this is what I do to generate my keys. I selected some e, some integer, which is relatively prime with 160. I chose 7. There are, there are multiple answers I could have chose. I could have chose 3, 7, 9, 11. I chose 7. Okay, so you need to choose one. We'll talk about which one's appropriate later. Once I choose E, then I calculate D. Such that E times D mod 160 equals 1. And we go through and you find quite quickly that 7 times 23 is 161. 161 mod 160 is 1. Gives us our key pair 
the public key of B, some user B who generated this key, we think of E is 7, N is 187, and the private key of B, D is 23, N is 187, the same value as the public value. So in fact the private value is D. By private we must not tell anyone what the value of D is. E and N we tell everyone. It's public, but D must be kept secret. Turns out also P and Q should be kept secret. Don't tell anyone P and Q. So we'll look at what the attacker can do. As well, one last step we did. We encrypted something last lecture. We took some message 88. We used the encryption algorithm, 88 to the power of E, mod 187, using the calculator, 11. And then we sent the ciphertext 11 to B, and B decrypted 11 to the power of the secret value D, mod 187. And with our calculator, we found it was correctly 88, the original M. Let's attack and see what the attacker can try. First we'll try if they have the uh, ciphertext only. So A, A sent a message to, to B. And the attacker intercepted, but what was the message? Well, it was C equals 11 in our case. The attacker intercepts. What can they do? Well, we look at what the attacker knows, the values that they know. The known information to the attacker, the algorithm is known. Okay, that, that's common. We assume the attacker knows what algorithm is used, RSA. So they know all the steps of the algorithm. What else do they know? They know C equals 11. They've just intercepted the ciphertext. What other information does the attacker know at the start? Any other values? E and N. So they effectively, well, they know the public key. By definition, it's public. The attacker can know it. The public key of B, which was E equal to 7 and N187. So that's known to the attacker. This public key uh, is known. They don't know the private key. In particular, they don't know D. Currently, they don't know M. How do they find M? Find the message. Try and find M, given those values in the algorithm. Well, remember we know the algorithm, so M What does B do to get M? B takes C to the power of D mod N. That's what B does. So the attacker knows these values. The equation for decrypting is you take the ciphertext raised to the power of D mod N and you get M. That's no good for the attacker, not yet at least because look at the values that they know. There are too many unknowns. They know N. That's good. They know C. They want to find M. They're missing D. Okay, you cannot solve that equation. If there are two unknowns and four variables. You cannot solve it without other information. So, what can the attacker do now? 
They want to find M. To find M, they'll need these three variables. They know C and N. C is 11. N is 187. Therefore, they need to find D. If the attacker can find D, they'll easily find the message. They just take 11 to the power of whatever value D is, mod by 187, and they'll get the message. So the challenge now for the attacker is to find, <coughs> find D. But let's, let's make it a little bit easier for the attacker. All right, we'll come back to, we'll see some approaches to find D in a moment, or how they can uh, do it. No, let's go through them now, and then we'll make it easier. What about brute force? Brute force is, if to, to find D, try all possible values. So, remember the message in practice would have some meaning. So a brute force could be, take your ciphertext, raised to the power of 1, mod n. Do we get a message that has some meaning? If not, raise to the power of 2, 3, 4, 5, and keep going until we get a message that has some meaning. So a brute force, try all possible values of D. So that's the brute force in this case. How do we stop a brute force? Make D large. Okay, make it large enough such that even if you have to try all possible values, it would take forever to do so. Okay, so that will be one requirement, that D should be large. Um, or, um, we know uh, normally 100 bits or, or more, if it's 100 bits long, it should be long enough because it will require 2 to the power of 100 operations, which would take uh, too long to calculate. So brute force will not help if we make D large enough. But let's, let's make it easier for the attacker. Let's say they have obtained a message from prior communications and the corresponding ciphertext. So let's give them some more information. Uh, let me give you a value. Okay. Okay. Let's let's go through. I was going to make it easier, but let's let's go for the full way. All right. Let's. How do we find D? Well, you're right that in the key generation step, the attacker knows these steps. They they know that the user. Uh, created their key this way. User B created the key using these steps. So they want to find D. Well, how do they find D? They know that D times E mod the totient of N equals 1. Let's write that down. So the other thing that we know is that E times D mod the totient of N is 1. And we know E. E is 7. So we know that 7 times D mod the totient of N. And we know N is 187 equals 1. So this is known to the attacker. So now, from the attacker's perspective, if they can find D here, they will break RSA. What do you need to do as the attacker now? What's your next step? No brute force. Be, let's be smarter. Uh, correct, but go slower. Uh, from this equation, what do we do now, next? Yeah, we, what's the totient of 187? Okay, so because I gave the answer last lecture, 
okay, well, let's look at the steps that we need to take. Yes, we need to know the totient of 187. How do we do that? Let's say I ask you to do it manually. You to take 1, is it relatively prime with 187? 2, 3, that's like a brute force attack. Try all possible values of 1 up until n minus 1. But you know there's a faster way. How do you quickly find the totient of 187? Find the primes. That is, factor 187 into its primes. So the So that will quickly find us the answer. What are the primes? The prime factors of 187. So you, now you know, because we went through the answer last week, because that's what we did with generating the key. But the attacker's challenge is, given n, remember this is n, to find the totient of n, we've got two approaches. One is to factor it into its primes. Once we factor it into its primes, then we can quickly calculate the totient of n because it's just the uh, prime 1 minus 1 times prime 2 minus 1. p minus 1 times q minus 1 in our setup. What's the other approach? Really brute force of simply for all values of n uh, have an algorithm to find um, let's say uh, how can we describe it um, the totient of n is generally check whether the numbers are relatively prime 1 and 187 2 and 187, relatively prime between 2 and 187, 3 and 187, up to 186 and 187. 8, 7. So two ways to find the totient of some number. One is the, the, the slow way. Take every number up until that number, one less, and check if it's relatively prime with that. 1 and 187, are they relatively prime? Yes. 2 and 187, yes. 3 and 187, up to 186 and 187. Count them, and you have the totient. The other way, which is a little bit easier, is to factor that number n into its primes, and then we can immediately calculate the totient of n. We could do both. Okay, in the exam I could say, here's 187, find the answer, find the totient, you can. The problem is, we can't do both, we can't do either if n is large enough. If n is very big, factoring n into its primes is considered a problem that's too hard to, to solve. It takes too long. And the other way of trying all values from 1 up to n minus 1, again, is if n is very big, there's no known algorithm that can do that in reasonable time. So although we can do it with 187, if we chose bigger values, instead of 187, a 4,000-bit uh, value, factoring or doing the direct solving of the quotient is impossible. Uh, let's see the lecture notes that describe that. We have one here. And this was also mentioned in the one of the last slides in the number theory lecture notes. You'll see in the last slide there, there's something about the computational complexity. There are three problems we listed which are hard. That is, take too long if we have large numbers. Factor n into its two prime factors. That's one that we we just saw 
and determine the torsion of n directly. So the brute force on the torsion of n. That's the attacks. And I'll go back to the number theory. Let's find it. We say, we've said that integer, integer factorization take n, break it into p times q is too hard to solve if n is large enough. I'll give you some more statistics later but I, we mentioned that uh, n which was about 230 digits long took 2,000 years to solve of computer power. All right, it was done in parallel. Nowadays n is typically 2,000 bits, 4,000 bits long. Solving Euler's totient given some n without factoring n to into its primes is also considered hard, in fact harder than factorization. So if it took you 2,000 years to do the factorization, it would take you longer to do the totient solving directly. So no, no use trying that. And this is where the security of RSA comes in. If we choose large enough numbers, we can't solve these problems. With 187 it's easy. But choose a 4,000 bit number for n, factoring it can't be done in reasonable time. Calculating the, the totient by looking at the numbers relatively prime with n can't be done with reasonable time. So we can't do that as long as we have large numbers. So any other ways to find d if we can't do that? So if we can't find the totient of n, then we don't know what we mod by. And therefore, so this is an unknown, and d is an unknown, and we cannot solve that equation. We've got two unknowns. So if we can't find the totient of n, we can't find d. If we can't find d, we cannot decrypt, uh, and RSA so far is secure. Any other attacks you can try? How else in the exam are you going to break RSA? How are you going to try and break it? Let's, let's give you, and now let's make it easier for you, that is the attacker, and give you some more information. We said in this case the attacker knew the ciphertext and the public key. Their aim to find M, the original message, and to find M you need to find D. So in fact if you find the private key you can find M easily. So the aim really is to find D. And we said that if we try to do it by getting the totient of N, so long as N is large enough we cannot do that. But let's give the attacker more information. Let's give them a known pair of ciphertext and plaintext. Uh, let me give you a value. So what does the attacker know? From before, we knew some ciphertext, 11, we knew E was 7, N was 187. And let's say we've somehow captured a, a message, a plain text M, and, another, and the corresponding ciphertext which was created using the same keys. We have captured as the attacker M1 equals some other value, uh, 17, and the corresponding ciphertext 
when we encrypt M1 using the same key is 85. This is a known pair of plaintext ciphertext for the attacker. Again, the challenge, find D. If you can find D, you can find M. How do you find D? So I've, this is easier for the attacker because we also give them a known plaintext ciphertext pair. That is, M117 was encrypted using the key and we got the plaintext 85. So we know an, a value of M. Well, let's look at our equations and see what we can do. We know that we want to find D. We know that M equals C to the power of D mod N. So what does the attacker know in this equation? They know the M. They know C. They know N. They don't know D. We're trying to find D. We have an equation here. Four variables. Three known, one unknown. Easy to solve. How do we solve that? So you have an equation, four variables, three of them are known, one is unknown. You should be able to solve the equation. Right, what do you do to solve the equation? That is, find D if you know M, C and N. Uh, think about it in terms of what operation do you need to do to get D? log. Okay, we, we know c to the power of something mod n equals something. What's the inverse? We want to find the exponent and that's what a logarithm, a logarithm does. A logarithm gives us the exponent in this case and we call it a discrete log when we have a modulus. Going back to the way to write it from number theory we say that the discrete log of in base C with mod N of M equals D. I'll write D at the front. So I know C as the attacker, I know N, I know M. We have those values above. We have M is 17, C is 85, N is 187. We know those three variables. So all we do is solve the discrete logarithm. And that's another hard problem if the values are large enough. Yes, yes, there, 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 there is. We'll talk about some typical values, but yes, we know this. We can roughly know the size of D. Uh, it's about the size uh, of of N. So it's about maybe uh, 2,000 bits long. Um, so yes, we can know approximately the size of D, and maybe even exactly the size, but we don't know the value. If it's if it's 2,000 bits long you've got 2 to the power of 2,000 possible values. Okay. So brute forcing D, trying all possible values of D won't help here. So we need to solve the discrete logarithm. Coming back to our number theory, our last slide we said another problem which is hard is solving discrete logarithms. So solving a discrete log takes longer or, or comparable time to integer factorization. So if it takes you two million years to factor the integers, it's going to take about two million years to s solve the discrete log and a bit longer to solve Euler's totient. So therefore we can't break RSA as, again as long as we have the numbers large enough. 
and they're the main attacks that, or the avenues for attacks and that leads to the reason why RSA is secure in general because even though mathematically we can find Euler's totient, factor numbers, discrete logarithms, in practice we can't do it in reasonable time. So RSA security depends upon these math mathematical problems. That is, that no one knows any algorithm to solve the mathematical problems for breaking RSA. If you can come up with an algorithm for factoring some large number into its primes, you rule the world. Okay? That is, you can break into banks, steal money, do what you like. But at, no one, at this stage, there's no known algorithm for doing so. Any questions so far on RSA? So we've saw there's really three avenues. One is to break, let's go back. One was to, or the two different approaches to solving the totient. The brute force approach takes too long. Factor the n into its primes and then the totient is easy, but factoring into primes takes too long, so those two won't work if n is large enough. And then the third one, because in fact we can easily know the pairs of ciphertext and, and plaintext, solve a discrete logarithm. Again, if our numbers are large enough, too long. So RSA is considered secure. What have we got next? Of these three problems, integer factorization, solving Euler's totient, discrete logarithms, it's generally considered that the easiest of the three is integer factorization. That is, if you're going to do an attack on RSA, try and factor n into its primes, because that will be the fastest of the three approaches. But still, if n is large enough, faster still means impossible. So the measurement of the security of RSA is usually measured in terms of how long it takes to factor some number into its primes. Let's go back to our RSA lecture notes. Here's some, some values that uh, reported and uh, getting old. So there was a competition and people have tried in the past, given some large n, factor it into its two primes. And in 1991, the, the largest value that was done was around uh, 100 digits, 330 bits. Okay, 330 bits are about 100 uh, decimal digits. Uh, but then people come up with better algorithms and with faster computers. In 2009, someone reported that they could factor a 232-digit number into its primes. It took 2,000 years on a single-core computer at that stage. So, of course, they had many computers, but equivalent to using one computer for 2,000 years, and they could factor this, this number into its primes. And that's with n. So this is, in fact, the, the length of n in RSA, 768 bits at that stage. Of course, computers have got faster. About every two years, they get double the speed. The recommended values for N in RSA, the typical values are 1,024, 2,048, 4,096 bits of N. And recommended today is usually 2,048 or 4,096. Most new applications would be 2048 bits. So 768 bits took a lot of effort, even though it's uh, five years ago. Increasing the bits, one extra bit effectively doubles the effort. Remember? So from 768 up to 1000 is another 250 bits, so it's the amount of effort is 2 to the power of 250 times larger. Okay. So, it's still considered impossible. So, 
So, the attacks on RSA. One is brute force D. Try, try all possible values of D. How do you stop a brute force? Make D large enough. Okay, make, if D is larger than uh, uh, hundreds of bits, then brute force is not possible. And in fact, the way to use RSA is make sure D is large enough. Of course, the larger D is, the slower the implementation is. And we'll see some results on that shortly. So brute force is not considered possible. And then the mathematical attacks that we looked at, factor n into its primes, determine the totient directly without factoring, or calculate the discrete log to determine d. Like all considered impossible with large enough values. There are some other attacks which are very specific attacks in certain circumstances. Uh, timing attacks, looking at the timing of particular operations. Turns out some of them are possible, but there are countermeasures that are not too hard to implement that make it secure against such attacks. Maybe at some performance penalty. Slows down the encryption, but still makes it secure. Anyone who survived through RSA today and is still interested, tomorrow at lunchtime, midday, I'll give a presentation about one of the latest timing attacks. So if you want to come, uh, let me know and I'll let you know the room at the end of the lecture today. What have we missed? We've gone through RSA. How long does it take to encrypt with RSA? Everyone's done their homework. Most people have been doing it. I've seen uh, about half of the submissions. Let's encrypt with RSA. Uh, let's use our speed test. You've used OpenSSL uh, to do some encryption with different symmetric block ciphers. It also supports RSA. I have to remember that I'm sure everyone had similar problems uh, with max and speed. Correct? So my, my computer is doing some RSA encryptions. Don't worry too much about the uh, private RSA and so on. We'll give the summary results at the end. takes a bit of time. It tries different length of keys. A 512 bit, think of the value of n. Now it's doing 1024 bits. It does it slightly different from block ciphers and symmetric ciphers. Uh, we'll see later that they are used differently than symmetric ciphers like AES. But once we get to the end we'll see the uh, summary statistics now it's trying 2048 bits. The longer the, the length of n, the longer it takes to, to encrypt. But it does 10 seconds for each. I hope it just does 2048 and stops. Ah, let's do 4096. Another 20 seconds, we'll get there. Everyone's done this in the homework, but using different algorithms and you get different output with your algorithms. And hopefully it's done, it prints some output of what version of OpenSSL it used and then it gives a summary down the bottom. For different length keys or different lengths of n from 512 up to 4096 bits. We'll come back to why sign and verify but let's try and look at the fastest. Um, with a thousand and a thousand, well, start with the easy one. 512 bits, the fastest value, the number of, think of the number of encryptions per second, 189,000, or about 190,000 encryptions per second, you can do that. 
That's in fact using the public key, E. So this operation is using some value raised to the power of E mod N. The other one, sign, is using D, the private key, which is much slower. Anyone want to guess why? This is using some number to the some random number to the power of E mod N. Sign is using some random number to the power of D mod N. Power of D mod N is much, much slower. 15,000 versus 190,000. Ten times slower. Anyone want to guess why? I'll just write down so you remember. You have, you don't have them in front of you. M to the power of E mod N. In the results here, and we're not going to explain why, but this is the verify column. And the other operation, m equals c to the power of d mod n, same n, is the sign operation. And what OpenSSL does is tries random values and tries to encrypt them. We see sign is about 10 times slower, less than, uh, more than 10 times slower than the verify. Same mathematical operations. Number raised to the power of E mod N. The difference in practice is that E is usually small, a small value, and D is big, large. And as you may expect, taking some number and raising it to a small value is faster than taking a number and raising it to a large value. Okay. So signing uses the D value, the private value. 15,000 decryptions per second. Anyone remember their results of uh, using AES, Triple Des, Camellia, Blowfish from your homework? Some people decrypted. I think you probably get around, and I, it's measured differently, about 100, 100 to up to several hundred million or megabytes per second. 100 megabytes per second, 100 million bytes per second. It's hard to compare directly, uh, but 100 million or 128 million bytes per second, if your block is uh, 128 bits, it gives us 8 million encryptions per second. So with AES and those similar ciphers, we're getting millions of encryptions per second. With RSA, we're getting about 15,000 per second in the worst case here. So it's much, much slower than a symmetric block cipher. Like, uh, maybe a thousand times slower. Okay. So that's a problem with RSA. It's very slow. You increase your value of n from 512 bits up to the much, much more secure 4096 bits, fine. 86 encryptions per second from 15,000 down to 86, so very, very slow with a larger value. So this is the trade-off. Increasing security by having a larger n decreases performance. So you need to choose an appropriate trade-off. So you don't just choose the largest key possible, you make a consideration of also the performance. Now, we will not go into details here, but it turns out RSA is slow in terms of implementation. People have made some optimizations to try and speed up the implementation. And in fact, OpenSSL uses some optimizations. And the common optimization is instead of taking C and raising it to the power of D, you do, so you're doing an exponentiation with a large D, that's very slow. What they do is that they create, get two intermediate values. Instead of getting D, they find this DP and DQ. And they do a modular exponentiation with 
the two smaller values, c to the power of dp and then c to the power of dq. And it turns out, and it's not so much interest today, but it turns out that it's much faster, about four times faster, if you, instead of doing one number raised to a very, very large number, you do at that number raised to a number half of that size twice. So instead of raising to D, you raise to a number of about half the length of D. And then do it again, and it's about four times faster. So there are ways to improve the implementation, the speed. Same calculations, same results at the end, though. Same security level. And it means that normally, to improve the speed, you don't just store N, E, and D, you store some intermediate values. You store N, E, and D, you store P and Q, and also some other intermediate values are often stored. Yep. But to get P and Q, you say you have to factor P, right? Oh, sorry, Th this is from the, the person who generates their key. This is the step, this is not from the attack, this is going back. Where are we? So normally we generate, when I generate my keys, I get, we've said E and N are my public key, D and N are my private key. So I really need three values to store and, and use for later, E, D and N. But to speed up the implementation, the algorithm uses some intermediate values. And in fact, when you generate your own key, you have N, E and D, but you also store the initial primes. So when I generate my key, I know P and Q because I chose them. I store them. And I know these intermediate values because I calculated them. So in practice, when you have your own key pair, there are two public values, N and E. You can tell anyone your values of N and E. And the private values, which are usually stored on your computer for yourself and must be kept secure, of course, the N and E, which are made public, but also D, P, Q, and these intermediate values. And they are used just to speed up the implementation, to, to make it faster. When you generate your own key, and you'll do it in, in another homework after the midterm, you'll generate your key and you'll see these values. Okay, so you can generate your key and see the actual values. Uh, I'll see if I can find an example. got an example key that I'll show to see those values. I've generated a key uh, from a previous time. So this is, I use OpenSSL to generate my own key pair. And I made that, in the public information available to others. So this is my private key information. And we can look at the values. Uh, key key. Input is my key, and let's output into text. This is my private key, and it's encoded there. Not encrypted, encoded, but later it shows me the, the actual values. My modulus, N, 2048 bits. Of course, it's not shown in binary, it's shown in hexadecimal here, but you can count the di digits, 2048 bits. That's N, E. We say the public exponent. It's the exponent, and it's one made public, that's E. Here's the decimal value, 65,537. And that's very common. Most 
implementations of RSA will use the same value of E. It's public. So it doesn't matter if everyone in the world has the same value. And it turns out that this value is good for implementation purposes. It's considered secure and also fast. Other values, the larger it gets, the, the poorer the performance. So E is usually known or fixed. Then the private exponent, which is my D, my value of D, there it is. So it's about the same length of N. There's my D. You need to guess that value if you don't know, to know it. And then the following values are also private to me. Remember, with the key generation, we choose two primes, prime one and prime two. Open SSL chose them for me. And these are the prime numbers. They're about uh, a thousand bits long. So one thousand one, one thousand bit prime multiplied by another gives us our 2048 bit value of N. So 1,024 bits, 1,024 bits for the two primes. Again, these must be kept private. The primes must be kept private, secret. And then the exponent 1 and the other values, exponent 2 are, and the coefficient, they are these intermediate values which are used to speed up the implementation. So that's where, in a private key, we store all these values. I don't show anyone my values. The values of N and E, I put in another file and make them available to everyone on a website, in an email, or however. And then you can use my public key. Uh, some final points about the performance of RSA, how fast it is to implement. Again, generally it's very slow, so there are some optimizations to try and speed it up. We've seen a couple. Uh, we're using modular arithmetic, so in fact we take one number, raise it to the power of some other large number. That can be very slow, so there's some properties of modular arithmetic that can speed that up. Choosing E, Typically, you choose a fixed value, so there are some popular values. Nowadays, 65,537 is the, the default in most cases. Doesn't make it any less secure, uh, but it makes the performance faster, usually. If it's too small E, there may be some special attacks, but you can usually overcome them by uh, adding some countermeasures. So, n nothing practical. Choosing D, of course, it cannot be too small. Uh, the larger D is, the slower the encryption using D is. But there are some algorithms to make it reasonable using uh, even a large D. So there are some algorithms that speed up the, the implementation. The Chinese remainder theorem and Fermat's theorem can help with the implementation. Choosing P and Q, choose two large prime numbers, is not easy even for a computer. So what they usually do is you choose two uh, random numbers, large random numbers, a thousand bits long, and apply some tests to see if they are in fact prime. And the tests may not be 100%, they may give some probability of confidence that they are in, indeed primes. Finding large primes is uh, a slow task. Uh, so Usually they choose large numbers and then test if it is prime. So the generation of P and Q may take a little bit of time. When you generate your keys with OpenSSL, you can actually see it takes, in some cases, maybe a second or so to generate them. And that brings us to the end of RSA. It's a very important algorithm. It's the main public key algorithm used, and it's still used widely. Even though there are some, some special attacks, it's still considered secure in the general case. So uh, it's important to know how it works. When we come towards the end of the course, we'll see when you connect to a website, and using HTTPS, you often see that secure icon in your browser to show you've got a secure connection. 
One part of that is you get a certificate from the web server trying to confirm this is in fact the right web server. It's not something pretending to be that web server. Those certificates make use of RSA commonly. Okay, so we'll see them come up in practice later. Let's stop there for today. We still have, what, one remaining lecture before the midterm. Thursday, so you're going to have a, a long New Year break, uh, but come back Thursday. And Thursday, there are a few slides I skipped over before here. We will not go on any further, okay, so we'll stop there. But there are a few slides that we need to cover that we skipped over. We'll go back to them and then maybe have some examples and talk about the exam on the lecture on Thursday.